Then the slideshow says, Vamana Dwadashi. And as we were discussing this, is a really concentrated uh, Vaishnava Kalan week. Of course, we have Lalita. What is it? Lalita Shasti or something. So Lalita's appearance day is on the 6th or something of the, of the month. Then there's a Saptami in there. Then we have Radha Astami, the 8th day for Radharani. And then ninth day, I don't think there's much. Maybe 10th day also not much. But then, today, then uh, here in uh, Tennessee, today is Akadasi, Ekadashi 11. And as we're discussing, uh, tomorrow is Vamana Dwadashi here. Looks like you've got a combined or something. So Dwadashi means 2 and 10 or 12. And as we have to fast until noon on the appearance days of incarnations, uh, so therefore on Akadasi today, we, we do the fasting for tomorrow today. So we have a complete fast until noon on Akadasi today. And then we can break the Akadasi fast tomorrow morning before noon. And then uh, tomorrow is uh, Vamana Dwadasi here and the appearance of Jiva Goswami. Jiva Goswami. And then the day after that always, uh, Dwadasi Triodasi is then, uh, I think, what is it? It's the appearance day of Shabhakti Vinod Thakur and disappearance day of Haridas Thakur. So, of course, because of this, we're having our World Holy Name Festival week also. So it's also World Holy Name Festival, and we're observing it by having a 12-hour kirtan and academic symposium here in Tennessee. And then Monday is Vishvarup Mahotsava. It's finally we get to Purnima after all these things, or something like that. And that's the anniversary of Srila Prabhupada Sanyas. And also it's the anniversary of Upadeshamrita Kijai. So is that, that enough festivals for you? So then Monday we should actually then have a birthday cake or whatever it is. And I think the Upadeshamrita. Let's see, in the newer versions, they don't include that sometimes. Yeah, it says right here, September, September 20th, 1975, Vishwarup Mahotsava. Prabhupada wrote his preface and dedicated the book. So 40 years would make it uh, 2015. So that means that the Upadesha Amrita should have a birthday cake with 39 candles on it. And you could read the entire thing in sequence like that. So there's just no limit to how many birthday parties and everything we can send off parties we can have here. For the PowerPoint show, we have uh, uh, Vamana Dave. And if you can look at it, there's all kinds of nice art. There's a nice picture of Vamana Dave surrounded by some vegetation with a little umbrella and a halo. On the right side is a picture in the, from the Bhagavatam, the BBT picture of Vamana appearing. And everybody gave him charity according to their particular position, like that. So, uh, slide number two. Okay. This is Shema Bhagavatam 1, 3, 19. So, of course, the sages, they ask, Sudha Goswami, please tell us about the purpose of all the different incarnations. And so, in uh, text number 19, he says, Pancha Dasham Vamanakam Krit Vagad Advaram Balahe, Pada Trayam, Yacha Yacha Manaha, Pratya Ditsus Tri Pishtapam. Okay, slide number three, translation. In the 15th incarnation, the Lord assumed the form <clears throat> of a dwarf Brahmana, Brahmana and visited the arena of sacrifice arranged by Bali Maharaj. Although at heart he was willing to regain the kingdom of the three planetary systems, he simply asked for a donation of three steps of land. In the Prabhupada's purport he says, The Almighty God can bestow upon anyone the kingdom of the universe from a very small beginning. And similarly, he can take away the kingdom of the universe on the plea of begging 
a small piece of land. So I think that's kind of one very, very, uh, what, impressive statement. And right now, we're maybe all of us, we're trying to do different Sankratan programs, preaching programs, and maybe we're doing a little bit here, a little bit there. But at any time, you know, Krishna can give you uh, the whole universe for your for your preaching activities. Of course, that may be a blessing or a curse, you know, <laughs> depending on what happens. But Krishna is quite competent. You know, so I remember one time I was coming off the altar in San Francisco Temple, Berkeley Temple, after addressing the deities. It was you know time for the last arctic, and another pujari was doing it. And it, before the arctic started, there was a uh, um, what do you call it? Um, a lecture of Prabhupada playing, a cassette of Prabhupada playing. And I always remember Prabhupada said, the magic, the magic will not be done by you, nor me, nor any living being. The magic will be done by Krishna when we become pure devotees of Krishna. So that's kind of Vamana Day, is that he accomplishes all the things. He's Urukram, the big worker. Uh, we're, we're probably what, you know, uh, something Krom, <laughs> Mahapurush. So we're Kim, 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 Kim Krom, <laughs> little workers. Okay, next slide. And we downloaded some, uh, some art from the uh, Internet. And here's a very, very nice relief of Bhamada Dave taking a big step, you know. Another one, a nice, nice pot of a little bit rotund brahmachari with his pot, an umbrella. Umbrella. Next slide. Okay. Oh, here's a very, very beautiful uh, South Indian uh, vomit a day. Very beautiful features. So on the internet, you can find such beautiful pictures of vomina. Next. Okay. And then uh, slide number seven. No, no, what is it? Slide number six. Uh, Prabhupada always liked us very much to chant the Das Avatar Stotra on these different incarnation days. It's nice austerity for today. And if you memorize the, the verse that pertains to the particular avatar on their incarnation day, then pretty much painlessly, within one year, you will have memorized most of, the, most of them. So we can maybe all chant together here. Chalayasi Vikramane Balimad Bhuta Vaman Hadanaka Nirajanita Janapavan Keshava Dripta Vamana Rupa Jai Jagadisha Hare Jai Jagadisha O Keshava, O Lord of the Universe, O Lord Hari, who have assumed the form of a dwarf Brahmana, all glories to you, O wonderful dwarf. By your massive steps, you deceive King Bali, and by the Ganges water that has emanated from the nails of your lotus feet, you deliver all living beings within this world. Okay, next, next slide, number eight, number seven. There's a word-by-word word meaning. Let's go on then. Number eight. eight eighteen five. On the day of Shravana Dwadashi, the twelfth day of the bright fortnight of the month of Bhadra, when the moon came into the lunar mansion, Shravan, at the auspicious moment of Abhijit, which I guess is noontime, the Lord appeared in this universe. Considering the Lord's appearance very auspicious, all the stars and planets from the sun to Saturn were munificently munificently charitable. It's interesting because uh, um, tomorrow, today is also the appearance of Jiva Goswami, and his disappearance day is also in the uh, in Shravan, Shravan Nakshatra, which is very auspicious. He appeared and disappeared on Shravana. Okay. Next slide. 8.18.6. Oh, Krishna, when the Lord appeared on Dwada... Oh, King, sorry. Oh, King. I didn't quite get the... When the Lord appeared on Dwadashi, the twelfth day of the moon, 
The sun was at the meridian, as every learned scholar knows. This Dwadashi is called Vijay. Conch shells, kettle drums, drums, panavas, anakas vibrated in concert. The sound of these, these and various other instruments was tumultuous. Being pleased, being very pleased, the celestial dancing girls, apsaras, danced in jubilation. The best of the Gandharvas sang songs, and the great sages, demigods, manus, pitas, and fire gods offered prayers with satisfaction to the Lord. Next. The Siddhas, the Yadaras, Kim, Purushas, Kinaras, Charanas, Yakshas, Rakshashas, Suparnas, the best of the servants, and the followers of the demigods all showered flowers on Aditi's residence, covering the entire house, while glorifying and praising the Lord and dancing. When Aditi saw the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who had appeared from her own womb, having accepted a transcendental body by his own trans- own spiritual potency, she was struck with wonder and was very happy upon seeing the child, Prajapati Kashyapa, ex- explain, Jai, Jai, in great happiness and wonder. Number 11, slide 11. So in, in general, the whole pastime, of course, is based upon the fact that Bali Maharaj, the son of uh, Aditi, the son of Diti, Diti, uh, conquered Indra, who was like his cousin. cousin. And then Aditi, I was feeling the mother of Indra, was feeling disturbed because she wanted her, her sons to be in heaven, you know, because she wanted to get the Janmastimi outfit. She wanted her sons to be Sankirtan leaders, she wanted her son to be temple president, GBC secretary. And what happened? Her co- co-wife and sister, her sons were the Sankirtan leader, temple president. And so she, she was a little upset. So then she uh, sweet-talked her husband, Kasyapa, into giving her the pile of rata, the milk, milk, milk austerity. And she did this for one year with this idea of, of almost like, I guess, killing, killing her sister's kids like that, you know, to adjust things. And so she did it very faithfully, and by that, of course, she became very purified also. So then as we read, Lord Vamadeva appeared in a Vishnu form, and she was in overwhelmed with devotional ecstasy and not feeling any envy of anybody. So Lord Vamadev said, I know why you're worshiping me. You know, you want something. Yeah. Hey, you, you, you want that your children can be the kings of the universe because you want to worship me the way you want to worship me. And so we see, even here in the seventh canto, very subtle contamination. Yeah. They both want to worship Krishna, Vishnu, but uh, Aditi wants to worship him the way she wants to worship him. And so then there becomes this conflict in the temple, in the yatra, because of this rivalry about how to worship Krishna. Okay. So Vamanade says, you know, but what can I do? Uh, Bali Maharaj has won his position by following my standard, my rules. So I can't take it away from him. But worship of me never goes in vain. So I'll find some way to, to favor you. So then, of course, he went there. He didn't take everything away. We know the story. In spite of Sukracharya's adamant you know, protest, Bali Maharaj gave three paces of land. And because of that, in the end, he was pushed down to uh, Sutala Loka. And he's staying there with full authority to control everybody. And later, he'll become the Indra himself. And then Sukracharya was pacified. He's a Brahmana. And, you know, he, he said, yes, yes, really, there was nothing wrong like that. But I'm stuck in this position of having to take care of my wife and daughters and satisfy them. You know, so anyway, yes, everything was okay. But basically, that's the story of, uh, of Bali Maharaj 
and, and uh, Vamana Dwadasi. And of course, there's so much more detail, and I'm sure all of you are going to discuss it unlimitedly in your different ele- elevated communities. If we go to the next slide here, though, we come to appearance of Jiva Goswami. And here's a nice picture we got from the internet. Somebody took a black and white snapshot of Jiva Goswami at his little table there writing with ink on, uh, on palm leaves. And it looks like, when it rests me, looks like there's a Karelian photography of his effulgence too. Okay, next one. Okay, number 13. Uh, of course, Jiva Goswami was the son of, who was he the son of? What? Say there. Anupam. Okay. So actually there were three brothers, of course. Uh, I think Anupam was the youngest. Then Rupa, then Sanatan. And Anupam left his body pretty early. He was maybe a Rambakta. But his son was Jiva. And then Jiva, of course, grew up in under the uh, tutelage and guidance of his uncles. But he also had gone to Varanasi uh, and studied Sanskrit there, as far as I understand, like that. And he was a very, of course, very unbelievably prolific, prolific writer. The Mahabharata has 100,000 verses, but we've heard that Jiva Goswami wrote 400,000 verses. Yeah. And of course, his Tattva Sandarbhas are, we say, the basis of our, our Vaishnava culture. I've heard that Mayavadi sannyasis say that you can argue with Madhvacharya's logic and statements but with Jiva Goswami, it's tough. Yeah. So Prabhupada said that amongst the scholars, the Vaishnavas are the greatest, and amongst them, Jiva Goswami is the greatest. Like that. Yeah. And of course, so many pastimes. He was a the the, the the you know the Rasa Guru and the spiritual master of Srinivas, Duki Krishna, and Naratam. And actually, after the disappearance of Sanatana and Rupa, he became the accepted Acharya of all the Vaishnavas in the world. And along with this, he was also managing all the Goswami t- uh, temples. Was even, even not too long ago, like, was it like eight years ago or something? A handwritten contract was discovered in Radha Temple, which was the land, la- land grant by which he got the, uh, the land in that area to use for their worship like that. Next, last slide here. So, thank you very much. You know, for your kind attention and the opportunity to talk about Vamana Dev and uh, Jiva Goswami. Any comments about them right now before we go on to the verse, today's verse? Okay, so let's go to the other slideshow then. This is Idam Bhagavata Anama Puranam Bhagavatam Uttama Shloka Charitam Chakaram Bhagavan Rishi Nishraya Shraya Lokasya Danyan Swasti Ayato Mahat. The uh, Shima Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of God. It has been compiled by the sage Vyasa and the maturity of his realization. It is all successful, all blissful, and all perfect. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So as far as I understand, we're supposed to be doing uh, Second Canto, Chapter 8, Text 4, for this Iskan Hawaii Sangha, Friday, August the 5th. And next Friday will be August the, uh, it'll be Friday the 12th. It won't be the 13th. Okay. <laughs> And then Srila Prabhupada is the founder and charya of our, our whole society, our guru. Let's go to the next slide then. Okay. So please repeat. Srinvata Shradaya Nityam. Srinvata Shradaya Nityam. Grinantash Cha Svachestitam. Kalena Nati Dirgena Kalena Nati Dirgena Bhagavan Vishate Hurdi Bhagavan Vishate Hurdi 
Persons who hear Shema Bhagavatam regularly and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of Godhead manifest in their hearts within a short time. Purport. Baba says, cheap devotees or materialistic devotees, now here's the word shraddhaya, because a uh, kanista adhikari is not a shraddhavan, but a madhima adhikari is a, a shraddhavan. Okay, so that's the first qualification. Cheap devotees or materialistic devotees of the Lord, who are not shraddhaya, 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 are very much desirous to see the Lord personally without meeting the requisite qualifications. Such third-grade devotees should know well that material attachment and seeing the Lord face-to-face cannot go together. So here's one of the requisite qualifications. We have to give up material attachments. So in the previous verse, actually it says, Maharaj Pariksit had already given up his connection with his kingdom and family, the most attractive features of materialism, but still he was conscious of his material body. He wanted to be free from such bondage also by the constant association of the Lord. So there's the, the fact that third grade devotees, they have all, we, we, we third grade devotees, have all kinds of material attachments. You know? uh, wife, children, house, community, nation, and also to the subtle body. It's described that Mars Pariksit had given up all this gross stuff. He really had given it up. And he wasn't thinking, I have, to, I have to take care of people. What would they do without me? No, let them all smoke marijuana or whatever they want to do. <laughs> I'm finished. But he was still conscious of his body, which is not a very good thing if you're going to be bitten by a snake bird, as all of us are. So he wanted to also come to the platform of ecstatic attachment to the spiritual platform. And then his body would be a minor thing when it was lost, just like, you know, giving up a uncomfortable shirt, uncomfortable, un- un- uncomfortable garments. You're actually happy to get rid of the things. So that was his qualification. He was uh, a shradavan, and also he was chagi. He'd given up his uh, other, other attachments. Then Papa goes on. It is not such a mechanical process that the professional Bhagavatam reciters can do the job on behalf of the third grade materialistic pseudo devotee. Now here's swa chastitam. We have to do it swa ourselves, like that. I was thinking about this mechanical process. So when Papa was writing these, of course the mechanical process was still a human being. But now the mechanical process is, you know, is uh, recording devices, iPods, you know, whatever we're all using. So somebody may say, Prabhu, I have all of Jiva Goswami's works. I just downloaded them all today. And you say, well, did, have you heard any, heard, heard any of them? Well, no, Prabhu, I haven't got time. <laughs> but, but my computer has them all. So that's getting really mechanical. And we expect our computer, having all these things on our computer is going to like take us back to Godhead or allow us to see the Lord face to face like that. Now, let's go ahead here. Slide number six. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. The iPods or, or professional men are useless in this connection because they are neither... Okay, someone's got to close your mind there. Because they are neither self-realized nor interested in the liberation of the audience. They aren't self-realized or interested in the liberation of the audience. They are simply interested in maintaining the material establishment of family attachment and earning some material benefits out of the profession. Okay. So this, of course, takes us back to 281, the first verse in this chapter, that the person who we want to hear from, okay, the person we want to hear from is uh, Narada Muni. And he, he is self-realized and he's really concerned about the liberation of his audience. So you can see the published purport is, is really 
you have to see it from the perspective of all the previous verses. Mars Pariksit had no more than seven days to live. But for others, Maharaj Pariksit personally recommends that one hears Shemad Bhagavatam regularly, nityam, always, by one's own effort and with serious devotion also. That will help one to see the Lord Sri Krishna manifested in one's heart within no time. Jai. So as we are not seeing Krishna so much manifested immediately, then maybe we're, we're lacking in our regular hearing and all these kind of things like that. Hmm. Yeah? Okay. Let's go on then to the rest of purport. Uh, slide number seven. The pseudo-devotee, however, is very anxious to see the Lord according to his whims, not making any serious effort to hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly and without detachment from material benefit. That is why the way recommended by an authority like Maharaj Pariksit, who heard, uh, that, is, that is not the way recommended by an authority like Maharaj Pariksit, who heard and benefited by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. That's the end of Pablo's purport. And as we were hearing this, what was striking us so much is our own, like, you know, whimsical way of engaging in devotional service, you know, this and that. You know, um, like, you know, in the temple, we're supposed to have very regulated devotional service with the deity following a strict timing standard, uh, a strict standard of liturgy, prayers, and these kind of things. And so we may start becoming lax about that, especially if we're, you know, we leave the temple atmosphere, have our own grihast ashram, or even sannyas ashram, you know. So we may be worshiping the deity and uh, be thinking like this and that, but are, are we following all the, the rules and regulations, you know, strictly? Or are we just kind of like whimsically offering things with uh, abbreviated prayers? Well, Prabhupada said you can offer fruit in your hand and things like that. You know? And at the same time, too, then we want to uh, see Krishna quickly. And so when we have a question about what we should do, if we should eat the extra pizza or not, we look at our deities and, and they kind of smile at us and we know, yes, Krishna is telling me I should eat the extra pizza. I see him face to face. So this is what was striking us, is that we feel personally very challenged you know, by the purport. But let's go ahead then with the uh, perspective on slide number eight. So as we mentioned before in the first verse, because about the first five or six verses, What's happening is that Maharaj Pariksit is saying he wants to hear more. Um, he wants to hear how Narada Nard Muni explained these things. Yeah. And he explains why he wants to hear. What is, what is the qualification? What is the result? And then, in about verse 7 or something, he starts asking all these questions. And in the Bhagavatam class, if anybody says any questions, you can raise your hand and present about 25 different Questions one after another, bona fide questions. So in 281, uh, Maharaj Pariksit inquired to Sukadeva Goswami, how did Narada Muni, whose hearers are as fortunate as those instructed by Lord Brahma, explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord, who is without material qualities? Yeah. And before whom did he speak? So Prabhupada in the purport says, how Narada Muni distributed the transcendental knowledge of the Lord will be explained in later cantos. Next slide. Okay. So in slide number nine here, we see uh, three, four, five, six. O oh, greatly fortunate Sukadeva Goswami, please continue narrating Srimad Bhagavatam so that I can place my mind upon the Supreme Soul Lord Krishna, and being completely free from material qualities, thus relinquish this body. So that's the whole purpose of meditation. And the technique so nice is just to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly 
and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of the Godhead, Sri Krishna, manifested in their hearts within a short time. The sound incarnation of Lord Krishna, the Super Soul, Supreme Soul, enters into the heart of a self-realized devotee, sits on the lotus flower of his loving relationship, and thus cleanses the dust of material association, as is lust, anger, and hankering. Thus it acts like autumnal rains upon pools of muddy water. So here, here is an interesting point because it doesn't actually mean we have to like, you know, see, see the Paramatma with his smiling face and his eye, eyebrows like dancing fish in our heart, but it's simply we're feeling his, uh, our conscience. You know, we're feeling form, form direction from our intelligence. And we, we see something in, we get the intelligence, right? They're telling us, oh, uh, look at it this way, think of it that way. So that's the Paramatma guiding us. And of course, as we go on, we start to have a, a rasa, you know, starts, starts to manifest like that through the Paramatma with Krishna, you know, as a servant, as a friend, you know, or, or a parent. So then we, we start to develop the rasa, everything else, based upon intelligence, not upon maybe like hearing, you know, Krishna talking in our heart, there you go, or else seeing the form of Krishna. But this Krishna present in the form of intelligence, and we can understand this is not me, this is coming. And when I'm not so nice about following the process properly, then I can see the difference in how, how Krishna is inspiring me and how many competing you know, intelligences there are in the heart. Like that. So in, in number six, then Prabhupada continues, a pure devotee of the Lord whose heart has once been cleansed by the process of devotional service never relinquishes the lotus feet of, the, of Lord Krishna for they fully satisfy him as a traveler is satisfied at home after a troubled journey. So, Shrindatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtanaha. Same instruction, but we're hearing it again, that it's Krishna who, who cleanses the heart. If we're sincere about hearing and chanting, then Krishna in the heart will cleanse it, and our relationship will be there, and then we, we won't give up uh, our relationship with, with Krishna once we have that. In the purport to 286, we'll see that Prabhupada takes it even further and says that in, in our activities, in our service, our life, not only do we go on with serving Krishna, you know, but also we go on serving Krishna in spite of problems. You know, a devotee has so many problems coming because of his service. He has to confront this political situation, this physical austerity, and because of that, you know, it's, it's troublesome, like a traveler out of home. We have to go out of our convenient devotional home and go out and preach. You know? But even still, probably goes beyond this at the text, even still we don't give up you know, because our, our relationship to Krishna is, is internal and subtle and, and, and we see why these things are happening. We see that Krishna is doing them, so we go on with enthusiasm. So that's pretty much a very, very nice perspective you know, for these questions like that, and why hear and chant, and then motivating us to hear and chant properly. But going on then, let's go on number uh, 10. This is the last one. You know, in today's verse, yeah, persons who hear regularly and always take the matter very seriously, we have Krishna establishing their heart uh, in a very short time. But if we look at, I was thinking about Bhagavad Gita, uh, 16, divine and demoniac natures. Because we're also talking about people here, the contrast, Prabhupada's talking about the contrast mostly. He's talking about people who don't do it properly. So let's look at next slide, number 11. And this is uh, divine and demoniac natures. Bhagavad Gita 1613. The demoniac person thinks, so much wealth do I have today. And I will gain more according to my schemes. So much is mine now and will increase in the future more and more. He is my enemy and I have killed him. My other enemies will also be killed. I am the Lord of everything. I am the enjoyer 
I am perfect, powerful, and happy. Of course, this can also be there in contamination. We're saying in our own community, in our own spiritual, religious community. You may think, oh, I haven't killed somebody, but I've got them expelled from the society. You know? you know? I am the richest man, surrounded by aristocratic relatives. There is none so powerful and happy as I. I shall perform sacrifices. I shall give some charity. Yeah. And number 17 going down here, Baba says, self-complacent, always impudent, deluded by wealth and false prestige. They become, sometimes, they sometimes proudly perform sacrifices in name only without following any rules and regulations. So this is the problem. We're all doing, worshiping the deity. We're all chanting, you know, japa, in japa brata. We're maybe engaged in the Sankirtan movement. But after some time, we see that the contamination can slip in. And so we're selling records or we're selling candles of teddy bears, you know, or, or so many things. We're using, using our masculine and feminine potency to weasel a donation out of the opposite sex, you know, flattering them or something like that. Yeah, so we, we're not really following the rules and regulations for the Sankatan Yagana. And we're not really following the rules and regulations for chanting our rounds properly. We're talking on the phone. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're not getting up early and chanting when our minds are, are free from the distractions of business and, and enjoyment. You know? So we have to watch out for this. That's what I was thinking. Otherwise, why, why is it that Krishna is not as manifest as he should be within our hearts? Because we're not doing it seriously. We're not doing it ourselves. You know? we're, not, we're not doing it you know, uh, proper timing and regulation. If we go on with this, number 12 in purport, Prabhupada says, Maharaj, there's a lot of wind coming through. Okay. You're the only one that can be heard. By the How's way. that? Better? Yeah, that seems like it's tough. Then. Okay, it's at 85 degrees here, so I had the fan on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, but don't worry. But, no, turn up the fire. Okay. Thinking themselves all in all, not caring for any authority or scripture. Okay, the demoniacs sometimes perform so-called religious and sacrificial rites. And since they do not believe in authority, they are very impudent. Uh, that's me. I don't accept GBC authority. I don't accept my sannyasi godbrother authority. Okay. This is due to illusion caused by accumulating some wealth and false prestige. Sometimes such demons take up the role of a preacher, mislead people, and become known as religious reformers or as incarnations of God. Oh, yes, Prabhu, so-and-so is a Shaktivesh avatar. Yes, yes. He's, he's figured out we only have to chant four rounds a day, one round a day. Yes, okay. They make a show of performing sacrifices, or they worship the demigods, or manufacture their own God. Common men advertise them as God and worship them. And in, in my experience in ISKCON, this was going on different times. So sometimes the temple president was God. Sometimes all the sannyasis were God. Another time we had gurus who were God. You know. And it, people, we, we all do this. It's, we have to, it's a contamination. We have to get rid of it. And by the foolish, they are considered advanced in the principles of religion or in the principles of spiritual knowledge. They take the dress of the renounced order of life and engage in all nonsense in that dress. Okay, again, myself, eating too much pizza, ice cream. <laughs> it's been not the diet of jo joking with women during classes. You know? It's all nonsense. Of course, Prabhupada goes into the more extreme situation of breaking the four principles. But the subtle form is there, and then we won't have a subtle connection with the Krishna. We're subtly breaking it. Actually, there are so many restrictions for one who has renounced this world. The demons, however, do not care for such restrictions. They think that whatever path one can create is one's own path. There is no such thing as a standard path one has to follow. The word avidi purvakam, meaning a disregard for the rules and regulations, is especially stressed here. These things are always due to ignorance and illusion. 
So we'll see also to again probably emphasize in this point that there are rules and regulations in mighty bhakti. And the big question is whether or not we've actually come to Raganuga. And so pretty much one nice definition is that when we're spontaneously following you know, the Vaidhi Bhakti, that, that's a very, very good test of whether or not we're actually on the platform of Raganuga. The gopis spontaneously follow so many of these rules and regulations like that. You know, and they don't like to, 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 to deviate from them. They don't like it. Not that they're always just comfortable. Okay. Next slide. Number 13. Of course, this is also discussed in Rupa Shiksha, and there it talks about the, uh, the creeper of devotional service. And so, Majula 19, 158 to 61, it says, Sometimes unwanted creepers, such as the creeper of desires for material enjoyment and liberation for the material world, material enjoyment and liberation, grow along with the creeper of devotional service. So we become tired with our material situation, the politics, you know, being 85 degrees. Oh, okay. The varieties of such unwatered creepers are unlimited. There's a good point. They're unlimited of these pseudo, pseudo bhakti, bhakti attachments. Some unnecessary creepers going with the bhakti creeper are creepers of, desire, of behavior unacceptable for those trying to attain perfection. Diplomatic behavior, animal killing, mundane profiteering, um, mundane adoration, and mundane importance. All these are unwanted creepers. If one does not distinguish between the, unwanted, between the bhakti creeper and the other creepers, the sprinkling of water is misused because, all, because the other creepers are nourished while the bhakti creeper is curtailed. So the more you chant your rounds, it only increases your attachment to your prestige, position, and sense gratification. Of course, you're also increasing your divorce that situation too, but you know, the main, main creeper can be choked you know, by these false creepers. As soon as an intelligent devotee sees an unwatered creeper growing beside the original creeper, he must cut it down instantly. <laughs> the real creeper, the bhakti lata, grows nicely, returns home back to Godhead, and seeks shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna. Next slide. Okay. And uh, the next, later, later translation, it says, the gardener, this is 1957, the gardener must defend the creeper by fencing it all around so that the powerful elephant of offenses may not enter. Papa says, while the bhakti creeper is growing, the devotee must protect it by fencing it all around. The neophyte devotee must be protected by being surrounded by pure devotees. So Papa usually uses the term neophyte as kanista adhikari, and uh, he also uses the term pure devotee as being at least majima adhikari, like that. You know? In this way, he will, not, he will not give the maddened elephant a chance to uproot his bhakti creeper. When one associates with non-devotees, the maddened elephant is set loose. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, Asat Sangha Tyaga E Vaishnava Char. The first business of a Vaishnava is to give up the company of non devotees. A so called mature devotee, however, commits a great offense by taking up the company, by giving up the company of pure devotees. A human being is a social animal, and if one gives up the society of pure devotees, he must associate with non devotees. Asatsanga. By contacting non devotees and engaging in devotional activities, a so non devotional activities, a so called mature devotee falls victim to mad elephant offense. So eating boga, you know, becoming absorbed in intellectual pleasure and discussing intellectual arguments with other professors of theology. Radhika was talking about that, how he sees so many devotees get into this academic world. And then after a while, they're only coming to temple sometimes. They think the lectures are inferior, uninteresting. And they get absorbed in this whole political wrangling and, and also intellectual gratification of, uh, of, 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 you know, of the view of, of Prabhupada's books and then broader scriptures like that. Mm-hmm. Next slide. So number 15. Whatever growth has taken place is quickly uprooted by such an offense. 
one should be very, very careful to defend the creeper by fencing it in. That is, by following the regulative principles and association with pure devotees. So chanting our 16 rounds, uh, full morning and evening program. Yeah. And, you know, even if one thinks that there are many pseudo-devotees or non-devotees in the Krishna consciousness society, still one should stick to the society. If one thinks the society's members are not pure devotees, one can keep company, keep direct company with the spiritual master, and if there is no, no, any doubt, one should consult with the spiritual master. So I heard from Prabhupada's lips that he would never die. He would live forever in his books. So always we have a healthy connection with Prabhupada's books. That's one way to always keep association with Prabhupada and to consult with him. Unlimited amount of advice in Prabhupada's books. However, unless one follows the spiritual master's instructions concerning the regular principles and chanting and hearing the holy name, one cannot become a pure devotee. By one's mental concoction, one falls down. By associating with non-devotees, one breaks the regular principles and thereby lost. Okay, 16. Okay. Uh, What's happening here? It's 15, 16. Yeah. Okay, so our time has kind of run out here, but uh, Bhakti Siddhanta then goes on to talk some more about this, and Papa says basically this bad association and everything else uh, can be analyzed as text number two of Upadesha Amrita. So even if we keep sticking with Upadesha Amrita, neophyte instructions for pure devotees, that's such a nice, solid basis. You know, for, for for keeping our ourselves avoiding these 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 false creepers like that. So it's kind of my whole whole content here, and I was just seeing one way after another. You know, it says that somebody may support a certain birthright uh, lineage, and so somebody somebody may take shelter of some some Gaudiya and Yasi or even Prabhupada or this and that, just because it's a comfortable uh, family situation by which one can get a comfortable post as an administrator, as a sannyasi. So as a sannyasi, I can preach in terms of uh, supporting this political group that I belong to as opposed to another political group. And then Prabhupada says, and then the other group will be banned from the temple, and like this and that. So we can see all these tendencies can be very easily applied to our own, own circumstances. And then we have to be cha- 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 chastised by these words to try and eliminate all these uh, different weeds that are growing in our, our, our garden. Otherwise, all the austerities we're doing are not going to give us this fast result of having Krishna established and at least taking us beyond the, the problem of death. You know? Because even if we die, if we're pure devotees and take birth again, we'll just tuck our head down and <laughs> keep on mumbling our japa for nine months and a few more months after that. And then... Uh, very early, early age, then we can say, Chai Radhe! Hey! At about, I'm not sure, what is it, about four months? <laughs> Chai Radhe! Hey! And right at heart, we'll know. We can take it with us and so on. So this is the first benefit, is coming to this ecstatic position where we can hang on to whatever we're developing, our service we're developing, and go on purifying it, and then yeah, carry it on in, in Srila Prabhupada's movement in a future life or else carry it on in the spiritual world. So that, that's our, our, our kind of realization of this verse. Go back to the uh, actual text here. Where are you, verse? Persons who hear Srimad Bhagavatam regularly and are always taking the matter very seriously will have the personality of God as Sri Krishna manifested in their hearts within a short time. So any questions or comments? We covered, a, covered a lot of ground here. Okay, that was wonderful, Maharaj. Now you've got to give me a second to go and unmute everybody. I'm going to take away the screen. It makes it a little simpler here. Hold on, Prabhu, while I get my thing together. Still up there. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, I did it. I unmuted everybody. Any questions or comments? 
Can you all hear us? I can hear you. Marash, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah, all correct. Okay. So you're emphasizing a very short time. And you know, um, in, uh, let's see, the, the verse, Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Yogyakya Jani Ati Ashu Vairagyam Gyanam Shriyadahai to come. Janiati Ashu, Janiati means produce Ashu. Uh, quickly, vairagyam gyanam shayada hai to come. So also we, we find the same point uh, echoed in, in so many verses quickly, but, but yet it, it seems to take so long. Um, in many of us it's been over 40 years and it... And we're, we're, we're trying pretty sincerely, but it still seems like it's not going fast enough. Because we've got a long way to go to really purify our hearts, to qualify ourselves, to become free from material desires and get this rascal mind under control so that at the time of death we can fully fix our mind upon Krishna. It seems, for many of us old guys, it seems like time's running out. So, um, what's going on here? Well, a couple things. Um, Because Prabhupada says also, as soon as one is in the mode of goodness then everything else about how to advance will be dictated. So, so again, that was the point I was making, is that if we just have good intelligence, that's the symptom that Krishna is manifested in our heart, because the intelligence is there saying, oh, watch out, you're getting a little loose about this. You know? And so I would say that we do have good intelligence, we are making progress, but like you say, it's also probably said become this human form of life, after hundreds of millions of lifetimes. So, so we're all thinking is what rapid progress means. But if you look at how much progress we've made, we actually consider, well, actually, never, maybe I have made rapid progress. And what, what does progress mean? In some ways, progress means just, just to stay with the process. You know? If you're still chanting your rounds, if you still you know, uh, uh, can tolerate the association of devotees, or you actually like the association of devotees, you know, your classes and stuff and hearing and stuff. You know? that's, that's quite an accomplishment. And it's quite an attachment. You know? And also, too, that maybe the senses are still the same old senses to a large degree. They, they see stimulating objects. They still are attracted. And the mind may still be the same rascal mind to some degree. You know? Okay, that's pretty much not going to change to a large degree. But the real question is if we changed at heart like that and so on. And sometimes we get distracted and don't see that. And, but we see other people who are our, our former material uh, friends. And we see how much they're still entangled in the gross material life. And for them, they are the body and they're just becoming so terrified of death that they're just killing themselves with junk food, television, intoxication, lascivious relationships, just killing, killing their, their self, self-awareness because they just can't face the possibility of their death. Like that. Well, we see other devotees who, who maybe stay for some time, and we see, oh, yeah, it's a fact. It's been going on year after year. Even an idiot like ourselves, by Prabhupada's mercy, can actually make some progress. You know? But yes, we should be seen. We should see. Adoshada, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajna Kriya, Nartanivriti, Nishta, Ruchi, Asakis. So we actually should be seen. Yeah, and maybe death is a death is a good friend for an old old age and death are good friends for a devotee. You know, Papa says she says old age is a good friend for a devotee because yes, it does push us, you know. And so then maybe okay, we're going to start making more progress after we kind of finish it off. It's kind of natural in some ways, and so we should, you know, t- take it seriously. But I would say we we have made some progress if we're still in a position we'll be worried about it, and don't. That's actually quite a bit. And then we can actually start to see how we can live without breathing, <laughs> how we can, you know, start developing different austerities, you know, to actually get ourselves ready to, to tr- travel between bodies. When we lose this body, we'll still have a body, but we have to be able to travel in that uh, bardo state, the state between bodies, and maintain our consciousness in the womb for some time, and have a, a, a nice long sound rest, 
and we come out again, and then we will be able to take with us, you know, whatever we've got from Prabhupada. My, my perspective. No, that, that's nice, Don. Um, especially you mentioned, um, well, I don't know if I should even say this in, the, in, in, in this uh, venue of the Bhagavatam, but maybe I will. Um, I, an old friend who I hadn't talked to, oh, this was a number of years ago, but I guess I'd been a devotee for over 30 years, and uh, a friend sort of called me out of the blue and, hey, how you doing? And uh, very proudly he said, uh, just as horny as ever. And I thought, oh my God, um, he realized what you said, the importance of just wanting to associate with devotees and how dangerous it is to associate with a non-devotee, how proud he was that his sexual desires were as strong as oh, yeah. ever. And any sexual desire I have, uh, which is still there, I'm disgusted by. And um, our whole consciousness has changed so radically. What, what, we, what we want and, and where we've come, it's a fact that when we look back, to see how far we've come, though it may, we do have a long way to go, but still, if we look, really look back at where we started, which is sometimes hard to do until we bump into an old friend or something, that really just puts it right in our face. But um, that's true. We, if we really take stock, and we have come a long way. And now we have the old age here staring us in the face that helps us. It's very helpful. Absolutely, it's helpful. Look at it. Just look in the mirror every day, and you get emphasis for spiritual life now. Prabhupada used to show us the the flat tire with his arm. You know, I've got flat, getting flat tires. The air yeah. the air has run out, and the, there's no air pump to oh. fill them back up again. So, you know, back when we were so young, and Prabhupada showed us old man flat tire. I'm getting yeah. flat tires, so it's it's wonderful. It, it, it is our friend, old age. Yes, the men and women both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All getting flat tires. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Great class. Yeah, great verse. <laughs> when I when I do these classes, I just try and try and work on them, you know. But I keep thinking about the audience and stuff. That's why it's very nice for me having this association, like once a week and so on. And I keep advertising it too, you know. Nice, nice sangha. Yeah. Well, for us, it's 12 o'clock. We can break fast now. <laughs> you guys. I mean, oh my goodness, yes. T- time for my noon offering. There you go. That's what happens. I, some, I think about my sense gratification and my intelligence tells me, what are you thinking about? And you think, no, I want, to, I want to offer it all to Krishna. You know, this David sitting here and looks like he, he's peaceful. So we can offer him some nice, uh, nice fruit, fruit and fruit juice and uh, cool him down, turn the fan on him. Um, yeah, at least, at least, I'm starting to consider that my sense gratification, and Krishna's sense gratification, both are important. It's not just mine only. That you know, Krishna should also have his fair share of the enjoyment. It's not just me. Mara, I, if, yes. if you have time for just one last question. One last question. What is a man? Okay. What is the duty of a man at the time of death? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll try and uh, as, ask this as sensitively as I can. Um, oh of course, we be concerned about our own anarchas and our own, you know, offenses and, and weeds. But um, it's a fact that we see uh, you know, sometimes we see other devotees that were are being or have been mistreated, and then they become um, uh, really discouraged, and they be, they themselves become offensive. You know, is I can't uh, argue with um, you know their complaints because it, it certainly seems that they've really been mistreated by other devotees. But then they themselves become extremely offensive as well, and then they seem to be going like down a a, a deep dark tunnel. You know, and there's nothing that you can personally do about it. Um, uh, should we just walk away from that situation if we know that there's nothing much that we personally can do? You know, that we uh, have our own anarchists and, 
we can't do any much to save this person, so rather than be further contaminated by them, just avoid their association? Or, I don't know, any advice? Well, yeah, you because know, it's just like, um, like Anar Hari was saying, certain verses, you, certain phrases like you know, stick out in classes or purports, and they kind of like they form your logic, you know. After a while, you kind of cultivate them. You develop your own logic about divorce and service based on a few phrases, you know. But I always remember the one is the Brajmanda Parikrama. That's one austerity I did. Other people do other austerities. But I stopped counting like seven times. And you're out there walking barefoot, you know, with stepping on thorns and, and uh, you know, hot cement and sleeping in tents with 100 people with a can- in the Indian canvas tents with people coughing all night, on and on like that. And so it becomes very, very intense. And this, this nighttime is nothing. You do Dhammadharastika, the, the gas lamps go off, and you go to, go to bed. <laughs> so in many ways, it's a very austere, intense program. And so many times, you just your mind just wants to start killing people, you know, even to correct, to correct problems uh, for other people. So I got this mantra then, and I guess I'd like to find a uh, something from the Bhagavatam to, you know, get the exact a nice Sanskrit thing. But basically, it is that in, in Vrindavan, only Krishna and Balaram kill demons. <laughs> so, so, so many times, <laughs> remember that. You know, you want to go berserk about something, you say, no, no. In Vrindavan, only Krishna and Balaram kill demons. Yeah. So, but we can always chant Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. Yeah, and go on chanting. And go on chanting no matter what happens. And never feel we haven't done enough. That's all we can do, great. And then if Krishna and Balaram want to empower us, they'll, they'll give us something. You've seen that sometimes. The, wor- the words will come out of your mouth and you just touch somebody. And they'll just fall apart right in front of you. Just like, you know, scare the, scare the dickens out of you that they just, you just touched them in the whole bubble of anger, hate, revenge, you know, it was just blown up like that. So that's what I say, we can always pray, chant Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, and by that process, get, get some potency like that. And when we get the intelligence and stuff, and then we use it, you know, to try and help people. But other than that, yeah, like you say, you know, that we're not, we're not the supreme friend. And so ultimately, if we're trying our best to help people, then we should also understand that, yes, some people want to be angry. They want, they want this revenge consciousness. There's nothing, nothing is, when, when a Mahabharat, after ripping Dushash from his chest open and drinking the blood, Bhima looks up and says, my enemy's blood is sweeter than my mother's milk. <laughs> so, so that is a fact. People are enjoying so much hating people who hurt them, you know, that there's no way they're going to give it up until... You know, they, they get an experience from God, you know. So that, that's my, my realization. You know? well, that's helpful. Thank you, Martin. Okay. okay so well, we come back. back. Oh, yeah, we did, we did. I counted up. We did 14 cities in five weeks. Edu- education in ISKCON. And now we're, we're out here with both barrels telling everybody they should become... Well, you, you all should start a Bhakti Bhai Baba Center in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. You all should start getting your... Actually, I actually have a program we, where we can all, all of Baba's disciples should uh, get their Bhakti Sarvabomo degree before they die. So I'm trying to think of develop this whole thing of a nice curriculum and study program, maybe two, two years of review for all of Prabhupada's books, including Chaitanya Charitamrita, and then uh, you know, doing a thesis taking a test, and then before, before we leave our bodies, we can get these uh, Bhakti Sarvabhama degrees for the glory of Srila Prabhupada. Jai. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, the Ministry of Education is hunting for you. Watch out. Get you all back <laughs> in school. All back in school. Okay, so, so thank you very much, and we'll, we'll be listening to the classes, and then uh, I guess next Friday is, is also nice if we can uh, participate then also. Hi. Thank you so much for this wonderful class. Really wonderful class. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Hare much, Krishna. Hare 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 Krishna